the ultimate journey is to find out you know who you are and to and to learn to overcome your selfishness and your greed and your guilt and your fear and your shame and all that so you can be a good human being and be present for others as well not just think about yourself all the time recognize that we're all one but actually have that experience it's not here you have to have the experience it ha your whole life has to change into that where others are just as important to you as you as what you might call yourself and yet you have to feed this body in order to take care of others, so you have to be feeding your own heart in some way in order to be able to do that. So that's what happens as time goes on. And then your own happiness isn't, isn't the biggest thing in your life anymore. It's irrelevant almost. Because it's not, the question doesn't arise anymore. Am I happy? How am I doing? This is, is this enough? It's just not, it doesn't come, come to you. It's not an issue anymore. And as a result, you are happy because you're not thinking about it. But you can't, you've got to recognize you can't stop these thoughts. The thoughts that we're experiencing now, okay, these are results of our own past karmas. Like, like a storm out on the ocean two weeks ago. The waves are just reaching the shore now, right? And they keep coming, and they keep coming. As long as the energy of that storm that created those waves has been transmitted through these waves, right? So it's the same with, with the thoughts that we have now. These thoughts were created by actions of our own in the past. And if you believe or you accept that reincarnation might be uh, true, then you'd have to say it also means th these thoughts and emotions and concepts about who we are and what we're actually even seeing out there and of ourselves are all the results of our own actions in previous lives as well. And there's no way to stop. You just can't go, okay, enough, break. It doesn't work. So we train ourselves to release the thoughts when we notice that we're, we're identified with them. And how do we train ourselves? By repeating a mantra or chanting, or watching our breaths, or doing some other so-called spiritual practice. They all involve paying attention. And if you're paying attention, then you can't be lost in thought. And if you're not lost in thought, then those thoughts are just, the waves just break over you and they, they disappear on the shore, never to come again. And if we allow the waves to just go through us and not fight against them or react or hold on to them or cling to them or push them away or get afraid or get desirous of them, then they just dissipate. But if we add our energy to it by any one of those actions, it just increases and makes more waves. That will continue to come. So that's the beauty of it right now. Is, is the moment, this is it, where we have full ability t t to really get here. You know, not later, not yesterday, now. All we have to do is look and start releasing these thoughts one by one. As soon as you notice you're not paying attention, you come back. Actually, it's even more subtle than that. By the time you notice you're not paying attention, you're already back. Otherwise, you wouldn't have noticed. So at that moment, what do you do? Wait for another thought to take you away again? No. That's the moment you come back. You dedicate yourself again in that second to the chanting or to the practice that you're doing. And you stay with it for as long as you can. It might be a billionth of a second, if you're lucky. If you've really been practicing for a long time. And then you notice again, oh, shit, I'm, oh, that's also a thought. <laughs> and you just come back. You don't think about it. You don't evaluate. You don't put yourself down. Because those are just more thoughts. None is worse than another or better than another. It's just the thought. Come back. And this is when we can do it now.
Not later. Not yesterday. Tomorrow, it'll be now for us then. And that will be the moment we can do it then, if we're here tomorrow. If there is a tomorrow. Right now, there's now. That's all we know. But we don't even really know that because we're lost in thoughts. Interesting. So, this is the moment when we can, we can really take care of ourselves, really change the course of the way those waves break and the way we create more waves right now. But you might notice that you, you're, you're sitting here, you, you're pretending to meditate and nothing's happening. That's good. You notice that. Really. Mostly you don't notice. You're here because you've all noticed something. The ones who haven't noticed are right now grilling up some cow and eating, drinking beer. <laughs> That's what they do this weekend in America. We celebrate the death of our beloved brothers and sisters who have died in the war by eating cows and drinking beer. How wonderful. So, but because you're here, you'd have to say you noticed something already, otherwise you wouldn't be here. And that's good. So build on that. That doesn't mean you're going to sit down and go, Psh, I got it. That's just a thought, isn't it? Right. Okay. Back to the breath. <laughs> when you got it, you never know you got it because you're not thinking about having gotten it. You just it. There's nobody patting you on the back, like, that was great, great meditation. <laughs> Sorry. Doesn't work like that. But on the other hand, there's nothing wrong with, with uh, giving yourself uh, some credit for, for being involved with this stuff, because, uh, because we tend to uh, destroy any positive feelings because of our unworthiness also. And that's not good. That's just more thoughts. That's not helpful. When, uh, no, who told us we can't feel good? I mean, I know who told me. But what about you? Who told you? Oh, yeah, that's right. Same person that told me told you. Our parents. Our parents told us, right? And we believed them because they were the only things. They picked us up, they put us down, they cleaned our butts, and they fed us. So they were pretty important. And if, if they weren't happy, then why should we be happy? Perfectly reasonable. Really. It is. That's the way it works. That's how karma is transmitted. One of the ways. And we tend to see ourselves the way our parents saw themselves, not the way they saw us. That's way too complicated. And later. But the first thing is, how did our parents feel about themselves? What was their field of energy like when they picked us up? That's what we absorbed. And then we start thinking and feeling about ourselves, the way our parents felt about themselves. And I know how my parents thought about them, so they hated themselves. You know, so what, what, what was I going to do? And there wasn't much, uh, much wriggling in that system, you know. So I grew up hating myself, right? And then they were unhappy that I hated myself, which was nice of them. Seriously, it was, it was nice that they cared. My father would drive me to the shrink. One time I actually jumped out of the car on the Long Island Expressway. I was so angry at him. That's what I did. So, they weren't bad people. They were just regular, normal, unhappy human beings who didn't know shit. They were good people. But they weren't happy people. So what, what was, what was, gonna, what, you know, what was I going to be like? That's the way it goes. But here we are. And here I am, right? And look at all this. So something in me, something that I brought into this life, possibly, was, was 
no matter how much shit was dumped on it, it still had some kind of ability to be really unhappy. <laughs> so unhappy, in fact, that it decided, hey, I better figure this out. That's good unhappiness. That's the longing. So. Hey. Um, Katie, I have a confession to make. Um, hold on, let me put on my proper ready? clothes, you know. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a rosary, I'm sorry. Um, I, I um, just spent four months, just about all of my waking hours, uh, managing a uh, political campaign, a local political campaign. And in the course of this, I stopped doing all my practices, I, you thought that would help? Uh, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> I, I, I was so focused on this. Stop doing practice, my practices. I d dedicated every waking hour to this, bought into my candidate's fears, put aside everything, just became totally attached to the results. Every, I did everything wrong. <clears throat> no, I was right. It was good. Mm. And so I just wanted to give you a chance to chastise It was nice you kept this. breathing. Yeah, I did. Yeah. That was good. Yeah, but I mean, I, how, how do you keep from doing that kind of stuff? I mean, I've been doing this for often, really, for 35 years, trying to meditate, trying to do the practices. Clearly, it's not taking. So what, where do you go That's from here? That's not clear to me. Why is it clear to you? <laughs> well, because of what I just did. Oh, because of your self-hatred. Right. Okay. <laughs> is that what it comes down to? Yeah. That's clear to me. Mm. I think it's beautiful. You ran into some karma, and you, you lived through it. That's wonderful. I think it's great. You probably won't do it again. Well, that's Probab the well, thing is, the campaign really isn't over, because I still have until November. <laughs> I think it's over for you, girl. <laughs> so that's my problem. It's not, I don't see why it's a problem. What's the problem about it? It's a problem because you think that you should have done something else or could have done something else. Actually, you had absolutely no choice. Why do you think you had a choice? You didn't have a choice. If you had a choice, you would have made it. You didn't. Boom, that's karma. You're in it. Now you may have a choice. Now you may have a choice because you saw what it's like to be asleep for four months, to live in dreamland completely. So now you may have a choice to continue to work on it and not be so attached to the results or to, and maybe find a way to give yourself a little space to calm down every day without a couple of beers or a glass of wine, or maybe not. Uh, maybe you'll do it in a different way, or maybe you won't do it, or maybe you'll do something else. But I don't see what anything was bad about what happened. Really, I'm not just saying that. Well, you should see some of the shit I've done. Oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, but you do let that me, kind let of me stuff just say the chance of a lifetime is the PG version. <laughs> it has PG stamped on it. Right, but that, that's when you're that's when you're young and foolish. You know, I, at this point in what my do you life, mean, last I should week. Know <laughs> young and foolish is the same as old and foolish. No difference. <laughs> what, what what are the lessons here? I mean, do, do you're here. What's the goddamn lesson? Is it a mi mystery? You're here, you're thinking about it, you're observing it, you're experiencing it, you're feeling the, the suffering involved in it. That's beautiful. That's wonderful. That's fantastic. You're not still out there. You're here. That's a big thing. Why did you come? Get out of here. Go back to the campaign. If I was a real guru, you know, I would say, back, ciao, do your work, until you're not fooled by it anymore. It's a karmic thing. It's not you. Just, you. You really think you had a choice? At what point in that did you have any choice whatsoever, except to feel bad about yourself? Well, I didn't feel bad about myself until I realized what I had done, because I was so in it that I didn't even perfect. See it's it. beautiful. That's the way we all go through our lives. Maybe not quite so uh, dramatically with a you know a four month long dream 
or a nightmare, as the case may be. But that's the way everybody goes. Nobody had, we all think we have choices, but when that button gets pushed, we're gone until the energy of that button has been spent. And then we go back and, what happened? Why did I do that? You didn't have a choice. You don't have a choice. Until you can, uh, s until you can sit and allow the thoughts to flow through and not be the thinker, you never have a choice. You only think you have a choice, and that's delusion. So you can develop some real humility here if you want to. And to see you didn't have a choice at all. How do you get a choice? Oh, you figure it out. You have to figure it out. I can tell you to sit and do Ram Nam all day or for two hours every day. And maybe after 20 years you feel a little bit better. But that's not the only answer. You have to figure out what you need to do to get a choice in your life. This was not a mistake, and this wasn't bad. I, I don't think it was bad. Everybody in this room is in the same position. We all think we have choices, and yet they're made for us by our own stuff, by our hunger, our desires. There's nothing wrong with that. You have to wake up in the middle of all that. There's no place else to go to wake up. You get woken up by life, just like this. It's good. It's a good thing. So the note, big note that I have on my mirror in my bedroom that says, step away from the karma, mm -hmm. doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, if you could see the, the one who's seeing, the one who wrote the note, the one who's reading the note, the one who's thinking maybe I should do that, and, but I can't do that, that's all karma. There's no stepping away from karma. <laughs> uh, you are the karma. Who you think you are, the world you see, everything you think, feel, imagine, this is all karma. You don't step away from karma. Every thought is karma. How do you get a vote? Who are you going to vote for? <laughs> <laughs> we'll I vote for her. We'll see. Good luck. Yeah, thanks. Let me know how it goes when we get here next year. Oh, I won't be here next year. Oh. Ah, shut up. <laughs> Wait a minute, I just want to sit with this for a little while. <clears throat> I did all the bad stuff I did after being with Maharaji. That's the extraordinary thing in my life. I was with him for th almost three years. And I didn't get into the real, really dark side of my nature until I came back. And that's why he sent me back, because he could have kept me in India. He could have kept me in, a, in, a, in the kind of state that I was in, in India, which was very devotional and very juicy and very um, plugged into him. He could have kept me like that, and he did for two and a half years. He, he, he made me, he, he, crea he allowed me to stay in India, even on the physical plane. When my visa was up, he sent me to a, a devotee of his who was a police uh, commander of police, and that guy got my visa stamped. So he actually allowed me to stay because I wanted to stay, and he let me. In fact, so what the story goes that Ramdas and a whole bunch of other Westerners heard about this uh, guy they could bribe in the visa department in Delhi. So they, we were all together with Maharaji in Allahabad and uh, at Dada's house. So uh, they just left to go to Delhi. They figured they'd be back in a few days, right? They're going to bribe this guy, get their visa stamped, and they come back. They didn't even say goodbye to Maharaji. And they left. When they got to Delhi, they found out that this guy had been busted or something like that or was no longer taking bribes. And they all got quit India notices, which means you have like 36 hours to be out of India. They couldn't even come back to say goodbye to Maharaja. They all had to go to America. So at the same time, my visa was up, and I had to apply for a, an extension. So I, I brought my, all my bags and stuff to Dada's house, and I was going to take the night train to Gaia, where the uh, agency was that I had registered with originally, which is where you used yeah, technically you have to go back to that place to get an extension. 
So I brought my bags and I left them on the porch and I said to Dada, you know, I'm leaving on the night train to go get my visa extended, but I don't want to, I won't go without Darshan. You know, I know my rights. It was bullshit because he could have said no and I would have gone. But he, so Dada goes in and tells Maharaji and <clears throat> Maharaji calls me in and I said, I'm going to Gaia to get my visa. And he says, so go. And I said, okay. I know you're everywhere. Hap, get out of here. Get out of here. So I went back on the porch and I had about two hours before I had to leave for the train. And a few minutes later, Dada comes out and he says, Maharaji says, don't go. He'll arrange for your visa. You'll go to Kanpur tomorrow and get extended. Great. So then, for weeks, all Maharaji could say was, look at Ramdas and others. They tried to go to the highest levels, and they all got sent back to America. But look at Krishnas. He's so humble. He go to the lowest, simplest of, and he gets to stay. <laughs> yeah. Right. If I could have gone with them, I would have, but I had to go to Gaia, so I could, you know. And he knew, he knew, but he played. So, I don't remember where I was going with all this, but I didn't know where I was going in the first place. Um, hmm? Oh yeah, right, no wonder I forgot. <laughs> My dark stuff happened after I left Maharani. Yeah, thank you. So he sent me back. So a year later now, from this point on, he looked at me and he said, uh, when's your visa up? I said, March 3rd. OK, you go back to America. This was our Christmas time. And I said, Baba, I'm just learning Hindi. Too bad. You have attachment there. You have to go back. So like I said, he could have kept me there. And he did keep me there as long as he wanted me there. He kept me. And I was. In my happiness, I was unhappy, and in my, unhap in my unhappiness, I was happy. It was okay. I loved being in India. I felt Indian. I, I wanted to, I, I had planned never to go back to America when I left the States. But he knew what I had to do in order to uh, be, in order to live a good life. And he knew that he could keep me there and over, keep overriding my own stuff because he could do anything, right? But that wouldn't have been good for me in the long run. And I might mention that none of y'all would be here today. So it was good for all of us. And he knew that. And he did what he did, not just for me and not just for you, but he did because it was the right thing to do. It was the best thing to do. Sometimes it didn't look that way. But he couldn't do anything else. Everything he did, because he was a perfected being, everything these beings do is for the best of everyone involved. So. What's the big deal, right? What's the big deal? It's not such a big deal. Is it? You still here? What's the big deal? You had fun? So? It wasn't enough? Right? It's never going to be enough, right? Guess what? That's the way it is. Congratulations. It's good you had the courage to do that, even though you didn't think of it that way. Most people won't do it. They'd be too afraid. And then they never get through shit. That's why you need courage to go after the things you want. You wanted this. You did it. That's fantastic. Really. It didn't end the way you thought it, you wanted it to, and it wasn't even the way you wanted it to be while it was happening. But still, you wanted it. You did it. You had courage to do it. That's fantastic. 
Really? Yeah, it is. Most people just wimp their way through life and they're dead. And that's it. And they never do anything. That's what I was doing, you know. And I met this old Baba in the jungle many years after Maharaji died. And he looked at me and he said, Ah, you have to develop willpower. And I thought, Willpower? Why do I need that? And he went, and then he showed me what he saw in me, inside me. He showed me inside of me what he was seeing. And I went, oh, like that. Because <laughs> I, I was like, I had shackles around my ankles. I was tripping myself up. I was crippling myself every step of the way in life. I was afraid to live. I was afraid to go after the things I wanted. I was afraid to live fully. I was afraid to really be involved with life and in life. And uh, who knows why, but I was. And when I saw that, though, it changed everything. Because I saw there's only one life. It's not like spiritual life and worldly life. And, you know, when you're doing this, you can't do that. And if you do this, you can't do that. No, they're the same thing. And if I was crippling myself in what I called worldly life, how would... That will that I needed to be successful and, and to really live, it wasn't going to all of a sudden motiv you know, appear when I sat down to meditate. Right? It's the same will. You're the same person. Sitting down, lying down, being busy, or sleeping. You're the same person. And if you're not doing it, it's not going to get done. So, and there's nobody to blame. This moment now is now. How you got here is irrelevant. You deal right now with the results of how we got here. Because when you try to quiet your mind a little bit, you see all your stuff. So how irrelevant, regardless of how it got there, you still have to deal with it now. Victim of this or victim of that or perpetrator of this or that, you still have to deal with it right now. There's many ways to deal with things. You have to find the best way for you. And you only find what's best by finding what's not best first, usually. Is what they usually call mistakes. I love mistakes. And I made so many mistakes. Maharaji saved me so many times. It's ridiculous. I would, I would literally jump off the cliff. And then he would move the cliff. And I would land on my ass, you know, instead of 4,000 feet below on the rocks. He did that all the time. But I finally learned that maybe you shouldn't jump off a cliff. Maybe, if you have a choice, which I didn't, which is why I was jumping. There was somebody. Hi. Hi. I think I'm I'm in a weird spot, like dark night of the soul. Do you have any Yogaville? <laughs> About as weird as it gets. <laughs> That's why we love it. It's just like us. Yes, go ahead. Oh, do you have any knowledge of that? Turn a light on if it's dark. That's what you do. Yeah, you know, go ahead, tell me more, because you asked a very generic question. I just gave you a very generic um, answer. Well, okay. Uh, nine months ago, I, all of a sudden, I couldn't pray. Then I couldn't read anything. Then I couldn't <coughs> meditate. Then I didn't have any dreams. Then it just was... Mm -hmm. Everything just sort of fizzled out. So? It's lonely and sad. Welcome to the club. Is now, there a reason for it? Is there, will it come back? There's it... definitely a reason for it. I don't know what it is. And probably you don't either, but it doesn't matter. There's nothing happens without a cause. So what are you going to do now? Mope around for the next 25 years? <laughs> do something. Your problem is that you thought the results of praying or the results of trying to meditate were at some point pleasant for you. 
and now they become unpleasant and you don't like that. So, too bad. What are you going to do? I don't know. Keep doing something, whatever it is, do something. You have to breathe, you might as well do something. Don't be so stuck in uh, expecting certain things. You're here. You'll be here tomorrow. You were here nine months ago. Nothing's changed, only your emotions about it. Mm. So, be here. Let them go. But you need to develop a way to do that. It just doesn't happen because you sit your ass down, you enter samadhi. You have to practice. And part of practice is not getting stuck in either pleasant or unpleasant. You like pleasant, you don't like unpleasant. So when it turned unpleasant, you, you stop doing. You know, come on. Was, at some point, we have to get past the, 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 the toddler stage here. You know? <laughs> you know, all of us, me too. So you sit, I sit, no matter what it feels like. It doesn't always, most of the time it doesn't feel very good, but that doesn't matter. It's the effort you put in to sit or do your practice that actually, that's the seed that you're planting, the seed of that effort. The result of that effort has nothing to do with you at all. You just, I'm going to pay attention for the next half an hour. Okay, now I'm going to pay attention for the next 29 minutes and 49 seconds. Okay, okay, now I'm going to pay attention for the next 29 minutes and 43 seconds. Okay, now I'm, that's what you do. That's the effort you make. And then the, the amount of time you actually are present will grow as time goes on. It isn't about how you feel. Not at all. It's not about you at all. You are the, your you is the problem. You know, and how you feel is all part of your you. You know, your yeah. you and my me. Your you, my me. I, I, I thank you. Well, yeah. I say you're welcome. Thank you. But that's the thing, you just do it, you know. So it doesn't feel the way you thought it should feel. That's just the way you thought it should feel, based on what? Your spiritual experience, the years you spend in the jungle, meditating in this life? I don't think so. Right? So it's good. You just got stuck in, an emo in a, you know, kind of a negative flow. So, next. It'll come back next time. Maybe it'll only take eight months and 30 days to get over it. <laughs> And maybe the next time only eight months and 29 days. I'll take it. I don't know about you. I'll take it. It's, it's all new. Somebody over there. Yeah. Mr. Om. Thank you. Uh, I'm a part of a small group of men in Washington, D.C. who are trying to... A little closer, please. I'm, a group, I'm part of a small group of men uh, in Washington, D.C. who are trying to organize a, uh, a men's yoga community, uh, sort of community Okay, based. you do that. I'll hang out with the other people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Strike that idea. <clears throat> It's very much in the early stages, but what I'm noticing is I'm... Yeah, men usually are. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole idea. So I'm putting this effort out, organizing meetings, cooking food. Very masculine of you. Uh, <sighs> <laughs> what did I eat? Oh, Cheerios. <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> Lucky I didn't need Wheaties, boy. And what happens is that out of a mailing list of, I think there are like 2,000 mm -hmm. men on this mailing list that we are reaching out to mm -hmm. to uh, see if there's an interest in mm -hmm. building more community. And um, the response is very meager. What? what? The response, the number of people who actually show up uh -huh. to contribute and brainstorm and uh -huh. pool resources so far is very small. Very small, that's because their wives read their email. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> there is oh. a question at the end of this. <laughs> Why didn't I could do the Late Show, right? What do they need Letterman for? He's a gone. <laughs> So I find myself Just put getting... a beautiful woman's picture as the head of the email. <laughs> Everybody will be there, I guarantee you. <laughs> really? She could even be doing well, a yoga problem, asana. We're thinking very inclusively here in terms of men's community. So not all men that we're including would be attracted to a beautiful women's photograph. I see. I'll take, I'll take that on advisement. <laughs> but what I found, I get very angry that people aren't responding and participating and joining and... Mm, the way you want them to. Exactly. I would be angry too if I was you. <laughs> and I feel that if I continue to feel <laughs> anger, I'm going to drive away anyone that would have been interested <clears throat> in the first place. How, so, I, so why don't you advertise for anger management for me? <laughs> You'll get everybody who'll be coming. It'll be fantastic. All the guys who are angry at you for trying to get them to come to this in the first place will be there. Uh. <laughs> so uh, the question was, how oh, do you... What was the question? <laughs> I can't even remember what the question was. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Just out of curiosity, I have no idea what it was. I think it's a question about service. Mm. I see this as what I can do for service. Right. And yet I find myself angry that those who I want to reach out to are not responding to my desire to serve them. <laughs> Need I say more? <laughs> How do you serve without feeling so attached to the fruits of your service? That's like asking God how, how he became God, how she became God. That's the whole thing right there. That's what Krishna says in the Gita. That's the, abs that's the last teaching he gives, you know, basically. You do what you do. But the, you, the fruits of your action or the results of your action are up to me, he says, not you. All your, your job is to, make, is to do it without recognizing that whatever happens, it, it's up to the universe to respond in the way the universe chooses to. Your job is to make the offering without any expectation. That's the idea. I mean, right now you're offering your anger unfortunately. And why would anybody want that? They got enough of their own. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's the whole thing. But just, just like with our friend over there, you didn't have a choice. You had a desire. You acted on it. And this is the result of that action, is you're even angrier. But there was an anger and a righteousness in the offering in the first place. My offering. I'm going to help people with this. And it's not even that subtle, you know, but it's there. And so this is great. It's just a mirror for you to see yourself, see the work that you have to do. And that's really probably, for most of us, the best offering we the first offering we make to the rest of the humanity is our work on ourselves and our, our attempt to be honest with ourselves about our, st our own stuff and not uh, imagine that we could put food in someone else's mouth that we don't even have to offer. Right? It's good. It's a good lesson. It seems one thing that seems 
a common theme today. It's just not fair. <laughs> we want to do all this good stuff, but shit, it's just horrible. It turns to crap. It's not fair, is it? Well, it may not be fair, but it's just perfect, you know. The whole first hour was about, it's not fair. You missed that. That's why. So, um, let's get real here for a second, you know. We can't even be present for a billionth of a second. And what do we think we're going to do for somebody else? Come on. Right. Really? Huh? Yeah, okay. You don't have to. You can step over the person sleeping in the street. You don't have to kick him. That's something. <laughs> but really, we, we have no control of our own mind, our own thoughts, our own actions. What are we going to do for somebody else? We, whatever we can is the answer. But what that is, is we have to be honest with ourselves about. Certain things we can do, certain things we can't do. What we can do, we will do, and we should do. What we can't do, we should figure, we should realize what that is and why that is. For instance, just with me, if I wasn't singing to save my ass, you would not be singing to save your asses. It would be entertainment. And we'd have a nice time, and then we'd go home and kick the dog. Now we might trip while we're trying to kick the dog and get saved from that karma because of the way we chant it. That's how it works. So I'm just not, I'm just saying that's, that's kind of the way it is. So we're really, we're all very much beginners, really, most, you know, human beings in general. We just want to, we're not even good human beings yet. We, we, you know, we're not even people who are really caring about others. And if we are people who really care about others, there's still that hidden self-hatred underneath it, self-abnegation, that we'd rather feed others than feed ourselves. And that's nice, but then we die of starvation, so then we can't feed others. So, okay, just a second. So we, we need to kind of like, you know, get real and see who we are and what we, what we want to do and how to do that. How long does this go on? Four thirty. Okay, back there, in the right, right there in front of you. Yeah, she has a question. Um, I was there when Swami Satchidananda asked you to come here every year. He, he actually, it wasn't really a question. No, no, it was an order. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I'm very aware of that. It was more like you will, and you took a little while, and you said, "Yes, Swamiji." Yeah. Um, if it would not hurt your physical body, I would like to ask you to come back next year. Just come to one place <laughs> here. <clears throat> Ask him, okay? Well, he hasn't told me yet. If he says it's okay to come, uh, but I think I won't. Uh, I mean, personally, I'd rather do this every day of my life anywhere, okay? Anywhere, with anyone, any day, at any time. That's what I would prefer. But it's reached a point, I think, that if I do take some time to... Uh, regenerate and rest, that I'll be able to do this for a longer period with more people and f over time. And that's why I'm taking the time off. 
because uh, I could, I could. Thank you. Uh, you know, because I could stream movies anywhere I am at any point. You know, I, I don't have to be home. And I sleep in hotels. I bring, you know, jade yoga mats uh, had given me some mats. And then they decided they wanted to, for their yearly calendar, they were going to uh, go around to the people they had given mats to and see, you know, take pictures of them using their mats. So they came, where were we? In what, Massachusetts, I think. Huh? Boston. So they came to a workshop of mine, and they, just, they said they wanted to shoot me using their mat. And I said, oh, uh, I don't usually use it at my workshops. Oh, really? Uh, where do you use it? Well, actually, I use it on the floor of whatever bathroom I'm in, in any hotel around the world, to sit there while I make chai. I went, oh. So we dragged a mat that they had brought into the bathroom of this place we were in, and they took pictures of me making chai on the floor of the bathroom. <laughs> but then they asked if they could also take a picture of me sitting on the mat and singing. I said, okay. And that's the one they used. In the, <laughs> um, so like I said, I'm pretty much at home everywhere, but my body wants to stop. And the mind, you know, the th I'm in... I'm in I'm like a, like, a, like a locomotive that has an automatic feeder, you know. Your locomotives work on steam, and they, they throw coal into the furnace, and the steam generated, and then the pressure pushes that locomotive forward on the track. I've got this automatic feeder, and it just keeps feeding the coal, and, but the tires, the, 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 the wheels of the locomotive are like worn down, you know. They got to be replaced. They need some time to be replaced. The engine's going to hopefully keep running for a long enough time, but it's just the rest of it's worn out. So, I started doing this when I was 47, touring like this. Most people start when they're like 18, you know, and have still a little testosterone left. <laughs> I started at 47. Now I'm like 190, and I it's just like. <laughs> How did this happen, you know? It was just like, so I, I, I will come back, but I really think that it's time to kind of take a break. But thank you for that, I appreciate it. And maybe you could move Yogaville a little closer to, to New York for the next year. <laughs> or I could, I could take a boat up the James River or something like that, that would be nice. Well, in a note of uh, compassion, Krishna Das, for your sharing, I want to share with you a very short story of um, my family trying to cross New York City uh, in a big rush hour, I think it was 4th of July, something. And we were killing each other. You know, New York, George Bridge, George Washington Bridge. Yes, George Washington Bridge, when you're like, oh my God, it's gonna like take three hours to cross that. So I was the weirder of the family, so I popped the off, chant, and my husband and my daughter said, huh, if we can just keep singing with you, I mean me, maybe, and that was the miracle of our family. Because after that, it became a uh, a family, one of our best moments, mm. one of our best memories. Wasn't that the day the George Washington Bridge kind of... <laughs> the, be the beautiful part of that is that five years ago, or four years ago, I don't know anymore, my daughter turned 21 and she came to see you. Ah, and she's right there. Where is she? Hey. Hey. How you doing? <laughs> and I never came to see anybody that I really love. I, I'm just too lazy to drive. Mm -hmm. But I'm very <laughs> honored that today you are here and I came because she's moving to California. It's another big story. Mm -hmm. And it's our last <clears throat> year 
on the road. So I'm so honored. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to thank you for, for... It's Letterman that retired, not me. I'm just taking a break. So I want to thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you. For, thank you. for that. Yeah, even just like David, now I'm doing this kind of repetitive motions like he does. I miss David Letterman. I mean, don't you miss him? Like I said, just the fact he's not there. I, I didn't watch hardly ever. But he was there always. You know, now he's not there. It's like, wow. That's the way I'm feeling right now. The gift of coming here on your last presentation at Yoga View for now. Mm. You, you, can, you live near New York? Yeah. I live in Maryland. Maryland. Okay. So it was a long trip. All the way past, I think we were going to Boston or something, mm -hmm. and we getting stuck in New York City in the rush hour. Yeah, I'll probably do some stuff locally around New York where I, you know, don't have to drive too far and I can be home at night during, after a few months, I'll probably do that. <clears throat> so. I also okay. want to... <laughs> To acknowledge yoga, your yes. devotion to Hanuma. To Baba Hanuma. Hanuma, yes. It was for me who has been very gifted in my spiritual path, a kind of osmosis through your CDs, that devotion really, really touched my heart. Mm. So okay. I can really feel that um, quality of... Um, doesn't matter what, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what. Mm -hmm. And that's what is so beautiful in you. Mm -hmm. Swami said, come every year, and you are here. Mm -hmm. So that sense of obedience, it is totally incredible. Thank you for role modeling that for me. Thank you. Yeah, until your heart is touched, it's really... Uh you don't have a sense of direction, you know. It's really the main thing that's, that, that we need to cultivate is that kind of a heart connection with whatever it is that inspires you. Um, Someone wrote to me, they wanted to linger in the longing. That's a beautiful phrase, isn't it? To linger in the longing, you know? Don't push it away. Feel it. Feel it. It gets deeper. It itself is, uh, is the flow of love. We experience it as a longing, uh, as, as if we're missing something. Uh, and, and that missing fills us so completely at times that you can't miss it. And that's what it's all about. It has to be feeling. You can't think yourself into this stuff. It just does not work. Because thoughts themselves are the prison, you know thoughts themselves, no matter how clear something might appear to us as our, in our thoughts, uh, it, it doesn't last. It's just like a kid playing with blocks and building a, a big structure and, and mama comes and time to go to bed. You have to wake up and do it again. So the thoughts aren't, aren't enough. But the feelings that come from, from connecting to something deeply are very different. They're very different. And Maharaj used to say all this stuff, you know. He, one time, uh, somebody was doing some asana practice and some meditation. He said, oh, these people don't need that, these Westerners. He said, they can get everything through devotion, with devotion. And you know, I used to think like, what's he talking about? You know, who's he? Who's he fooling? But I think he wasn't lying. You know, 
It's just that devotion, it gets a, in this culture, it gets such a, a weird spin, you know, as if it's a romantic love kind of thing. But it isn't. Devotion is not an emotion, although the emotions kind of get activated when your heart is touched by something deeper than, than an emotion. That's why it's okay to be stupid. Really. Like you. And like you. And like me. It doesn't matter. It's okay to be stupid. It's okay not to know. You can't know. It does not affect what's in there. Just because you don't know doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It exists. You're just a thought, an afterthought, actually. This, what's real is in there already, or we wouldn't be here. This is first. All this other stuff is after. So it's okay not to know. That's what saved me. That's why I'm, I'm singing today, because I quit singing. And I, because I, I saw that, you know, there was no possibility. I wasn't going to use it to, to just gobble everything up. Fame and money and people. All I was going to do is gobble, gobble, gobble. Because I could see what was coming, and I think this is great. Yeah, gamma gamma. But I was horrified. I was really horrified because that's not why I was doing this. I was doing this to find my way back into Maharaji's presence and back into that love. And I could not bear the the the, the truth that I was not going to be able to do that. I was not going to be able to refrain from using it all to serve my 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 myself, my my ego and my desires. So I quit. I quit, and I went back to India, and I said, Maharaj, of course, had been gone for how many years at that point? 94, 13 years? Yeah. No, 11 years. And I went back, but that didn't stop me from talking to him, and I said, you have to fix this. If you don't fix this, I'm not singing. That's all there is to it. Fix it or not, your, your problem. I'm singing to people in your name. Fix this, or I ain't singing. Good night. I did that for three months, and he didn't do a damn thing. <laughs> then finally, he did something, and one of the things that I experienced was that it was okay for me to be stupid and to take this personally. <laughs> See how I sit up straighter? It was okay because it didn't matter. It did not matter because what was real was that, was this. And even if I thought it was about me, it wasn't. That's what saved me. That's what, it was the expression of what freed me to come back and sing. You don't understand? You look like you're having a hard time digesting all my bullshit. <laughs> Are you okay? No, not you, her. Not you. She knows who I'm talking to. Don't be too careful. Relax. Take it easy. We got three days of this. And you ain't going anywhere. <laughs> so that was the thing that I understood intuitively, that even when I thought I was doing this, just like you, okay, now it's time for me to sit down and meditate. You think you're doing that. That's okay. You have to think you're doing it. Otherwise, nothing will get done. But that doesn't change the fact that what's in you is the truth, God, the presence, the one, the Atman, Shiva, Kali, Ram, whatever you want to call it. That's who's in there running the show. We just think we're doing it, but that's okay. Otherwise, nothing will get done because that's the way we do things. We think we're doing things. So... I saw very clearly it was okay to be stupid and think that. It didn't matter. It didn't change this, right? This is always here. This is, can't go anywhere. You can't be away from here. 
Everywhere you go, you're here. It's always here. And not knowing that was okay. Not being aware of that was okay. But that over time, through grace and training, uh, things would start to look different. <sighs> Still waiting, but someday. Look at these people in the wall. My God, it's so hard to look at them. Same to you. Every one of them. Huh? They were never here. They just pretended to be. <laughs> For our sake. That was the other thing when I came back from India. Uh, I went to visit a friend of mine in uh, New York, and I walked into her apartment, and she was watching the, uh, the video footage of Maharaji. And I laughed. I said, I, you're not going to like this, but I'm going to say it anyway. This is the one thing they made me take out of the book, the two things they made me take out of Chance of a Lifetime. <laughs> I couldn't explain it adequately to the editor, so I guess I just I said, okay, if I can't explain it to you, and nobody else is going to understand it, so I will take it out. She, she wanted me to take it out. So I walked in, and I saw this video footage, and I broke out laughing. And I said, that's not Maharaji. That's the Maharaji puppet. The real Maharaji made the Maharaji puppet for us because we're puppets. We have puppet eyes. We only see other puppets. And so in order to get our attention, the real great ones, they, they, they make a puppet of themselves. And they pull all the strings for themselves and everybody else, too, at the same time. And, and they do that for our sake, so we'll, to get our attention, to wake us up from the dream of thinking that we're running a political campaign. <laughs> I'm not even going to say it. Right? Isn't it amazing? I laughed. It was so funny to me. It was so beautiful. Okay. They didn't like it either. You know, okay, it's, this is the first day, right? Okay, I, I will, I'll let you live. Say what? Oh, you want to cry? Okay, we'll all cry together. Crying already? had a friend, two friends, Ed and Chris. Um, Maharaji named them Sudama, and he named Chris Sunanda. Sudama was Krishna's boyhood friend in the Bhagavatam, in the stories of Krishna. So uh, in the story, uh, Krishna and Sudama were hiding from a rainstorm one day when they were boys, they were out with the cows. They were cow herds. And uh, they fell asleep in the tree. They were hiding in this tree. And they fell asleep, and Sudama woke up, and he ate his lunch. He was hungry. But when he finished his lunch, he was still hungry, and Krishna was asleep, so he stole Krishna's lunch, and he ate. You know, let me just point out to you for a little advice in life. Don't steal God's lunch. <laughs> Not a good idea. Better to be a little bit hungry. When he wakes up, maybe he'll give you a little bit, but don't steal his lunch. So when he woke up, Krishna didn't say anything. Of course, he knew what happened. He never mentioned it. But that action created uh, terrible things for Sudama. And as he go got older, he was sick, and he became blind and very poor. They had nothing to eat. His family was destitute. They lived in a tiny little hut. And his wife, <clears throat> the one that read the email, 
she was on Sudama's case. You grew up with Krishna. He's your friend. Just because he's a king now doesn't mean anything. Go to see him and ask him for help. We really need something. Your children are starving. But Sudama was ashamed of himself and his, his position, and he didn't want to go. Not that he remembered the lunch. He didn't remember the lunch, but that's, that was the action, the selfish action that created all this stuff. So finally, he couldn't stand it anymore, and he said, all right, I'll go. Yeah, just like Jackie Gleason. Alice, <laughs> I'll go. So she gives him a little parched rice, which is like pre-boiled -bo cold rice, little, and uh, that's all they had. And he puts it in his thing, and he goes. And but when he gets to the to the uh, the, the palace, instead of going in and announcing himself, he was, you know, he just sat outside with the other beggars outside the palace gates. <clears throat> So uh, Krishna comes out, and he sees Sudama, and he says, oh, Sudama, I can't believe you've come. After all these years, come on inside, and I'll show you around. Showing the blind man around, whatever. And so he shows him, he takes him around the palace, and he says, this is it up in. So after a while of enjoying their company, he says, you know, I, I, I'm a king now. I have all this stuff to do, so I have to go now. But will you come back? Promise me you'll come back. He says, okay. And just as he's leaving, he said, did you bring anything for me? Did you bring anything for me? And he, Sudama didn't even say anything. Krishna reaches in and grabs the rice. Right? And he says, oh, I can't believe it. We used to eat this when we were kids. How great. And he eats up the rice like this, you know. And Sudama goes. So Sudama makes his way back home. And he turns onto the kind of the lane or the path that he's lived on. And he... The, there was this old wood kind of broken down fence, right? And he, he feels like a wall where this fence is, is supposed to be. And he's very confused. Now he says, I know this is, what is this? And he makes his way down the wall to the place where his old broken down gate was, right? And now there's like this metal thing there. And he's feeling this thing. And as he's trying to figure out what's going on, his wife and kids run up. And they say, wow, oh, look what Krishna did. He changed our, our hut into a, into a beautiful house with all this stuff, you know. And Sudharma was just, you know, he was just so moved. He was, his heart was just, uh, Krishna is so grace, gracious. And she said, oh, you must have asked for our help. And, of course, he knew he hadn't, that it was Krishna himself who grabbed the rice and ate it and, and blessed them without even being asked, right? So, Ed and Chris, Sudama and Sunanda. So we were all there with Maharaji up in the mountains, and uh, one day, Ed and Chris uh, decided they wanted to get married, and they asked Maharaji to marry them. And Maharaji said, no, I won't marry you, but Krishna does so marry you. So I went, oh, okay. <laughs> so a couple of days later, I think on a Tuesday, we, I put on my long, at that, I had regular white holy clothes at the time. Maharaji hadn't told me to make everything red yet. But, so I put on my white thing, and uh, we went and sat and stood in front of Hanumanji's mandir, and we read out from the Bible something, and I said, okay, you're, you're married. And that was that. So... Not long after that, Maharaji disappeared, and the group kind of went and did their own things, which is what happened until we found out where he was, and then we'd get back together. Some people went here, some people went there. And Chris, Ed and Chris, Sunanda and Sudama went back down to see Sai Baba in uh, Bangalore, Puttaparthi, because they had gone there first from America, because uh, the word was that you couldn't see Maharaji. In fact, they probably didn't know where he was yet. It was after I got there with Ramesh Ras and uh, Jagannath Dani that uh, kind of the word spread that Maharaji was now letting Westerners come. And then they came up from the south. So they went back south, and then they, Maharaji had jowed everybody, and they, so they kind of left. Jow means go away. He used to say, my mantra is go away. And people, he, people would come, you know, they were from long distances, and they would, 
They come and Baba, we've come. Yes, you've come. Now go. He, he didn't want you around. He didn't need you around. It was just irrelevant as far as he was concerned because he was everywhere. But he would let people come. He wouldn't let people stay much. So, Ed and Chris. So they went back to Sai Baba's and they went back to America. And um, I saw them a few times when I first got back to America. But then we lost track of each other, and uh, many years had gone by, uh, over 20 years, I would say, 15, 16 years. And uh, we heard that Sudama, Ed, and Sunanda, Sudama needed a heart and lung re transplant. Nothing was working. He was getting no oxygen. He was, and, and Sunanda was uh, fighting terminal cancer. She had cancer, and she was fighting it off with bee stings and everything you could possibly do. She did, she did chemo and all that stuff, and she was, it was like at that point about six years into it. And they had a son, Jesse. So uh, in 1989 or 1990, which was probably 16 or 17 years after Maharaji left the body, we brought a young Baba over from India to America. Uh, he was a sadhu that we met that we liked a lot. So we brought him over. And when we got to the house that he was going to stay at, the woman there, who was an old devotee of Maharaji's and an old friend of Sudama's, and Sunanda told the Baba that about Sudama, who was in very bad shape now. So the Baba looked at me and said, tomorrow morning, first thing, we're going to see him. So the next day, we drove to Queens. He was living in Queens in an apartment by himself. And he was expecting us, but it still took him 20 minutes to get to the door. So he had to kind of more than crawl. He had to just kind of push himself along the floor because he couldn't breathe. So he finally got to the door, and we went in. We sat down, and Baba sat on the couch, and me and Sudama sat below. Uh, and... Bob asked me to sing Hanuman Chalisa, so I was singing, and I, I saw Chris uh, Sudama, not, not Chris, Eddie, uh, mouthing the words, because he couldn't sing, he couldn't breathe, he was just, you know, and he was having trouble sitting up. And then after a little while, uh, we, we left him there and went home. So later that night, uh, there was a phone call from Sudama, and he asked for me, so I... I went, got the phone, and he said uh, how, how wonderful he felt and how incredible he felt that Maharaji had come back to him after all these years. And his heart was just completely full of love, he said. And uh, next morning he was dead. So Maharaji gave him that name all those years before. Same story. At the end of his life, everything came back to Sudama. And the same here with Chris, with Ed and Chris. And Sunanda, uh, six months later, their son died of an accidental overdose of heroin. And six months later, she died from the cancer. In 12 months, the whole family was wiped. Right? And I remember thinking, Maharaji could have changed this. He knew what was going to happen. And by not marrying them, he allowed this to happen. Because it had to be the, the only way or the best way for them to live through whatever karmas was creating this situation. He could override it. But perhaps it was better the best way he could do it was to allow it to happen as it was going to happen and to do whatever he could from the inside to give them the strength to live through it in the best way. See, that's what I couldn't explain to, to her, and I probably didn't explain it to you. I can't give you that kind of understanding that I have of Maharaji. I've seen him do everything. Every day you heard another story about him bringing somebody back from the dead, curing somebody's illness, getting somebody straightened out, 
every day, 24-7, that's all he did. And if he allowed this to happen, then it had to be the best thing for them. Otherwise, he would not allow it to happen. It had to happen this way for the, their own sake. And here's another thing. The Baba, who is not Maharaji and doesn't have that same, he told me to try to take care of their son, right? Jesse, the, the one who died six months later. And the funny thing was, I never saw the guy. I never saw him. I, I, I felt a little uncomfortable kind of jumping into his life. One day I was riding the subway in New York City. And I looked in the car, and I knew that Jesse was like, he used to quit, he used to play hooky from school and come into the city and do graffiti in the city and then go back home to the suburbs. I saw him on the subway car, and I looked at him. And he, we looked, he caught my eye, and then he just looked down. And I kept looking, and I think, is that Jesse? Should I say something? Is that Jesse? This is New York. You know, this is a subway car. You don't talk to people. Is that Jesse? And before I decided to try to get his attention again, he left the car at the next station. And then next thing I heard, he had died. Maybe if I had reached out to him, maybe something would have happened. It wasn't to be. It wasn't to be. Blind, stupid belief is not required, okay? It is not required, it's not needed, it's not necessary, it's not desirable. But to develop a real living faith in yourself, in this path, in the great beings that have revealed this path to us is a, is a very blessed thing. It's a very big thing. It doesn't come really through our own efforts. It comes from opening ourselves up to the sunlight of their presence and receiving that light and feeling it. You, you don't make this happen. It happens within you through the blessings of the saints or of, you could say of whatever that is up there or in there. Um, and what our practice does, it opens us up to that. And in the process of opening to that, what, which really is, our version of ourself changes as time goes on. And we start living in a better way, in a more wholesome way, in a happier way, in a more caring way. We become better human beings, which is good. But You can't make yourself a better human being just by wanting to. It, you have to get the strength to do that through practice. What I mean is that you want to be a better human being. It's like just wanting to. It's like trying to pick yourself up like this. There's no leverage. When you connect to a deeper part of yourself, then you get the strength to let go of the stuff that stops you from being a caring, compassionate person the selfishness, the fear, the shame, the guilt, all the stuff that ties us up. We can only release that stuff as we get connect to a deeper place within us. You have to promise to sit there every day, okay, for the rest of my life, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's what we're talking about here. And you can't fake it. You can't fake it. Because what's the sense of faking it, you know? Come on. You're still you at 3 in the morning. You're there. And if you're faking it, you'll feel it. So you have to, it has to become real for us. That's, that's the challenge. And how does that happen? We keep breathing, no matter what. That's the first requirement. And then it's good to eat at least once a day. And then after that, you have to add a little something else, a little ram-ram, a couple asanas, 
whatever, you breathe a little bit, and that's it. Everything's good. And, and things change. But really what's changing is the way we live in our lives in the world. People don't. Nothing has to change around us. That's not the requirement. All those people don't have to give up their anger for you to give up yours. You know, when we're not angry, there's no anger in the world. Piece of cake. Whatever goes on, it doesn't destroy us. You know, when you're, when you're Jewish, the whole world, when you're in love, the whole world is Jewish. That's what all the swamis say. Ram Ram. Okay, that's it. 430.
Krishna.